This video is brought to you by Audible. This is the HMS Dreadnought. It was first launched in 19... I'm just messing with you. No metaphors today. I don't have time to explain why I don't have time for a metaphor. I came back to Destiny a few weeks ago after a full year-long break, which was pretty much the longest time I've spent away from Destiny since the Alpha launched in 2015. This makes this video fairly unique in my overall Destiny coverage because it's the furthest I've ever been from the game. Previously, when I'd done my reviews, I did so from a position of really understanding where the game was at before an expansion hit, which gave me a lot of confidence to talk about how the expansion evolved the game. This time around, I don't have that same confidence. In fact, I find myself being in the rather odd position of not really knowing exactly how I feel about Destiny at this point, which as a reviewer is not something I often experience. I think this lack of certainty I feel is probably not unique to me because never before has Destiny felt so upended. Presently, Destiny feels like it's deep in the throes of transition. Technologically, structurally, commercially, narratively, economically, every part of Beyond Light feels like Bungie have thrown the chips in the air and we're all waiting to see where they land. You might be scratching your head at this point and asking, what the fuck? Destiny has changed? Uh? If there's one common narrative out there from people who don't play Destiny, or at least don't play it a lot, it's the idea that Destiny is just always the same. It's a sentiment that even I shared when I was at the start of my Beyond Light journey, where the familiar enemies and familiar weapons and familiar power grind was all I could really see. For those that only return to Destiny for its brief campaigns and its headline features, the game today feels almost indistinguishable from the game that's existed since the Taken King transformed Destiny in 2015. But still waters run deep, and beneath this static veneer lies a veritable torrent of change. Entire planets have been deleted from the game, along with their strikes and PvP maps. The weapons and armor that players have grinded hundreds or thousands of hours for has been unceremoniously decommissioned. The upgrade economy supporting our gear choices is entirely new. The mod system has been completely reworked. The way Bungie builds and rolls out new content is new, as is the business model and platforms that support this content. Not since the launch state of Destiny 2 or The Taken King has the game undergone such radical change. But unlike The Taken King, the benefits of this change are far less immediate. Fundamentally, Beyond Light removed far more from the game than it added. Planets, weapons, armor, maps. Most importantly, it removed the implicit understanding that Destiny was a universe that would continue to expand. We thought we'd locked in that understanding with the disastrous launch of Destiny 2, where players push back against a sequel that seemed to narrow Destiny rather than broaden it. With Beyond Light, we now know that Destiny is a universe that will expand and contract at Bungie's whim, and it feels difficult to invest in a future that is dependent upon something so fickle. Will the destinations we love visiting still be their next expansion? Will I still be able to play my favorite strike 18 months from now? I know my favorite legendaries will be useless in a year, but are my exotics safe? When even the supers we use are on the chopping block, we know that there are no sacred cows. As much as Beyond Light struggles to communicate a vision of the future to veteran players, it also struggles to welcome new players into the fold, to engage, to explain, to incentivize. As a lapsed player, I felt like Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt assumed I wanted to play them, rather than trying to earn my engagement through compelling activities and rewards. I had to dig deep to find the more enticing aspects of the loot game, many of them carryovers from the previous expansion, only to find that the best builds were essentially unavailable to me, owing to the way that vaulting, sunsetting, and the mod economy now works. New players today find themselves logging in each day to check Banshee, hoping he'll sell a mod that will transform their build and unlock an entirely new way to play, or farming materials to feed the new exotic kiosk, now the only way to obtain some of the game's most powerful exotics. With the very best parts of Destiny's loot game essentially walled off from new and returning players, Destiny feels like a game that is only speaking to and servicing its most hardcore players. But even despite this, I still found a way to fall in love with Destiny again. I have maxed my season pass, and I've leveled all three characters. I've done the raid half a dozen times, got all the new exotics except for the Eyes of Tomorrow rocket launcher, I've got Adored, the new Pinnacle Sniper, and I'm now working towards the ornaments for it. With the exception of Trials and the GM Nightfalls, I've done pretty much everything this expansion and this season has to offer, and I'm looking forward to what comes next. I really thought on this topic a lot as I put this review together. I was constantly asking myself, why, when half of this game has been deleted and all my gear is obsolete, 
and I can't build any of the good builds, and I can't get so many of the exotics. Why do I keep wanting to play Destiny? And the answer is that the core of Destiny is so good that it can survive this amount of demolition. Because that's what Beyond Light feels like. It feels far more like demolition than creation. Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt feel like Bungie have knocked down many of the pillars on which their game was built without a clear blueprint for what should replace it. We're now left with a stripped down, stripped back game that feels like it's readying for what comes next. Beyond Light is essentially Bungie asking us, how much do you trust us? If the answer is not much, then there's nothing here for you. But if the answer is a little or a lot, then Beyond Light feels like the awkward and stumbling first steps into the next chapter of the Destiny experience. When it comes to setups, it's difficult to imagine anything stronger than where Beyond Light begins. The darkness has come. No more whispers and waiting. It's finally here. This is the biggest boogeyman in the entire Destiny franchise. It's like the Empire in Star Wars. It's like Sherlock's Moriarty. It's like the Turtle Shredder. The darkness is the be-all and end-all foe of the light, and as a light-sworn guardian, we're finally going to have the chance to kick its ass. But the darkness is tricksy, and rather than confront us directly, it chooses a vessel to do its bidding. Eremus Kell. Now I know there's been plenty of fallen baddies before, but this one is special. Don't worry about Tanix the Unscarred, don't worry about Skolas from the House of Wolves, don't worry about Axis from Rise of Iron, don't worry about Fickrel from Forsaken. This one right here, Eremus, she's the biggest baddie of them all, and everyone else was just a warm up to this one. Now I'm being kind of facetious here because not only does it feel like we fought our fair share of Kells of Kells in the past, but this one in particular doesn't leave much of a mark on the franchise. At no point during your six hour or so long journey to bring her low, does she ever say or do anything that is likely to evoke in you a response? She doesn't kill one of the vanguard, she doesn't blow up the tower, she doesn't murder the Awoken Queen. She just kind of exists as this sort of narrative MacGuffin designed to lure you to Europa and embody the notion that the power of the darkness can be wielded as a weapon, one that you yourself can and will take up. This really is the central conceit of Beyond Light. It's the idea that the darkness exists as this malevolent force, but the power of the darkness is something separate. For those who use it, it manifests in the form of stasis. Ice-based abilities for your foes and an entirely new subclass for each guardian. You'll defeat Eremus's minions, each one of them granting you new abilities within the stasis subclass, with the final unlocks being buried deep in the post-campaign quest chain. I have to say that one of the biggest disappointments I had with Beyond Light was how it whiffs the arrival of the darkness. It reduced the darkness from being this distant, unknowable evil to being something that's kind of not a big deal. I mean, your ghost is constantly whining at you throughout the campaign like, Oh, I don't know about this. The darkness is bad. Should we really be using its power? And then by the end of the campaign, he's like, Oh, cool, you got the darkness. Let's go fuck shit up. Zavala is this unshakable, uncompromising bastion of light and never expresses anything more than mild concern about the fact that you're aligning yourself with the darkness. Again, at the end, he's like, Well, guess you got the darkness. I trust you. Now, go and farm me some strikes. Narratively, the arrival of the darkness felt so underutilized, so uninteresting. It never created compelling character moments that showcase just how dangerous this power is or how those around you would react to you using it. Imagine if a Jedi was like, listen, I'm thinking about toying with the dark side for a bit. You guys okay with that? And then the Jedi Council was like, yeah, man, that's cool. We trust you. Now go farm us some strikes. Even mechanically, the darkness feels underutilized. We're constantly warned about the dangers of embracing the darkness, so why isn't that reflected in our gameplay? Why isn't there any kind of risk-reward equation that comes into using this subclass, like a chance for our abilities to damage our fire team members if we aren't careful, or a chance to lose control and begin attacking our companions if we push things too far? 
I understand why these things don't exist from a balanced perspective. I'm just saying that the darkness, stasis, it just feels like another subclass rather than feeling like this truly dangerous force that we need to respect. Mechanically, the darkness is no different from the light at all, just another tool in our toolbox like any other. The bottom line is that after more than five years of waiting, the darkness arrived and I think all that was achieved is that we don't really fear the darkness anymore because it kind of works for us now and I don't think that's where things should have landed. Structurally, the Beyond Light campaign is little different to what you've experienced before and that it's probably five or six actual missions broken up by short stretches of grinding content throughout the solar system, but particularly on the new space, Europa. Europa is fine. Yeah, I liken it to the Plaguelands in Rise of Iron and that it borrows more than it builds. The great destiny locations like the Dreadnought or the Tangled Shore each dove deep into the architecture and lore of those who built them, expanding our conception of those factions. The Dreaming City invented an entirely new and dazzling architectural style that felt like a pinnacle achievement for the franchise. Europa doesn't have anywhere near the same grand ambitions, choosing instead to cobble together stuff you've already seen to populate its three corners. One of them Vex, one of them Fallen, and another Clovis Bray, and connecting all of it, White Tundra. Destiny has this weird habit of creating these massive playable zones for each expansion, and then only using the central sections of them for patrols and public events, which is crazy because the extremities of these environments have always been the most interesting parts. It's no different here on Europa, where the depths of the Clovis Bray research facility or the heights of Reese Reborn provide a vastly more interesting play space than Europa's barren, snow-covered expanses. It would be nice to see checkpoints, patrols, and public events at these further reaches of the map, especially when the center is the least interesting part. The post-campaign quests that unlock more of your subclass are similar to what you've experienced before in that they essentially just ask you to play the game in various ways to rack up kills, at which point you can hand in an item to get a brief bit of exposition. These brief interludes are undoubtedly the most interesting story beats that Beyond Light has to offer. The genesis of the Exo, the arrival of the Vex, and the origin story of the stranger and so much more is illuminated here. Had Bungie built their campaign around this story rather than that of an unremarkable Kel plucked from the lore files, I think Beyond Light's campaign would have rung out and been remembered as one of the best. When the quests are done, the main new activity Beyond Light offers up are Empire Hunts, which are just the missions you've already completed during the campaign, only now at a harder difficulty. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. It very much reminds me of the old heroic missions that we would do back in the day. I don't mind doing them, and one of them has a chance to drop an exotic, which is nice. Still, you can't shake the feeling that Beyond Light doesn't add a lot of new, never-before-seen gameplay content, because Season of the Hunt didn't fill the gap in quite the way it was supposed to. The main activity you're engaged in are what's called Wrathborn Hunts. You're dealing with Aldrin Solve. He's back from the dead and he doesn't remember who he is and he's now just handing out bounties. Either way, he gives you what's called a lure, which you have to charge up by completing different playlist activities like Strikes or Gambit or Crucible. And then once you've charged it up, you do a super brief solo mission where you blow up a mini boss. It's over in an instant. If Beyond Light hadn't radically reduced the loading times in Destiny, I'd say you spent more time on the loading screen than you do fighting the boss. It's a real bummer. Outside of that, the season nets you Duality, which is a slug shotgun exotic, as well as the Hawkmoon quest. Hawkmoon is a gun that we had in Destiny 1. It's back, only it's now had a refresh. I continue to be uninterested in Destiny recycling its old content, including Hawkmoon, which was among my favorite weapons in Destiny 1. I don't think that bringing back old exotics should be one of the headline features for an entire season's worth of content, but look, reusing old content is pretty core to the Destiny experience, so complaining about it seems pretty pointless. When it comes to the campaign and seasonal content, Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt are pretty unremarkable. They're not must-play experiences that I would recommend to anyone who was not already heavily invested in Destiny. Were it not for the arrival of the Stasis subclasses, it would be difficult to see how this expansion has meaningfully enlarged the game, especially when set against the backdrop of just how much content Bungie removed from the game with the Destiny Content Vault and Sunsetting. This will not be the end. It will be an escalation.
On June 9th, 2020, Bungie released a blog post titled Building a Viable Future in Destiny 2. A lot was said, but the TLDR summed it up well. It began with the words, Destiny 2 is too large to efficiently update and maintain. The size and complexity of the game are also contributing to more bugs and less innovation. The detail below would go on to say that the install file of Destiny will continue to balloon unless changes were made. It also said that the process of updating and testing the entire game was too slow and that much of the content that existed wasn't being used anyway. As such, portions of the game would be moved into the Destiny content vault, inaccessible to players until such time as Bungie chose to reintroduce it. Just prior to Beyond Light's release, it became clear just how much was going away. Four entire planets, seven strikes, two gambit maps, 11 crucible maps, five entire raids, 16 exotic quests, and 18 campaigns and quest lines tied to prior releases. This represented a mammoth portion of Destiny's overall content offering. When it comes to this topic, it's really hard to know how to feel. In this very post, Bungie label their game an action MMO, and if you look at every other MMO out there, they don't do this. No one does this. This is a genuine first for these sorts of games, where massive sections of them are just lopped off with only vague promises that they may one day return. I think a true north within all of this is the fact that we paid for this content. Like, that's a thing. Separate from the arguments about whether or not this is good or bad for the game, we definitely paid for this content. I like the Black Armory stuff a lot, but now I can't do it. I don't have a Whisper of the Worm catalyst, but I paid for the thing that let me earn it, but now I can't earn it. I owned the Menagerie, but never did it. Now that I'm back, I would like to try it, but I can't. I think as a general principle, once I buy a thing in a video game, I should be able to keep it forever. That's how it works in real life, and that's how it should be in games. That definitely feels right as I say it aloud. But we also live in the real world. Not all games are the same, they aren't built or maintained in the same way, and Bungie have told us that this isn't sustainable for the game that they've built, and they can deliver us a better product if they go another way. I'm really inclined to listen to that. I don't think they would lie about it. I think that if they say to us, we can make you a more fun destiny if we do this, then I believe that. So just as much as I'm guided by the principle of the matter, I'm also pragmatic enough to be like, all right, let's see how this goes. The problem is that if this is good for the future of the game, you certainly can't feel that now. Four planets were removed and we got one as a replacement. The Cosmodrome does not count because that is old content. 11 Crucible maps were removed, zero were added. Five raids were removed, one was added. 16 exotic quests were deleted, two were added. One of which was to obtain a weapon brought back from Destiny 1. I'm okay to see how this content vaulting thing goes, but I don't think Bungie got the balance right here because it feels like half the game was removed and only about 10% was added back to replace it and a few percentage points of that was recycled content. There could have been a more gradual approach to this, one that maintained a better equilibrium between serviceability and scale, but instead it's like the band-aid got ripped off really fast and it really stings now. The broader impact of this change is that we now know that Destiny is not going to continue to expand in the way that we had once thought. I'm naturally drawn to the scale of MMOs. Last year, I did the Final Fantasy XIV leveling experience, all 362 hours of it, culminating in one of the best storylines I've experienced in a game with Shadowbringers. Not every hour of my 362 hour journey was vital. In fact, you could have cut a lot from that game and it would have been better for it. But the fact that its most essential elements existed long after their initial release allowed me to go and experience them, and that let me fall in love with the franchise in a way that I simply couldn't have had I jumped straight in at Shadowbringers. That journey through Destiny is lost now. When new Guardians step into the game, they won't find something storied and expansive. They'll find something distinctly finite, truncated, almost transactional. Destiny's world isn't an organic, evolving universe that makes us feel small to step into. It's instead just a video game where its levels are crudely added and deleted and re-added on an as-needs basis. Many of the stories and moments that have made this game what it is today, made the community what it is today, are held now in the Destiny content vault. Locked away, on ice, in stasis. 
It feels silly to hear the NPC chatter in the tower about the Red War and Gaul's legions when you know there is no way for a new Guardian to experience that for themselves. Whatever net benefit this provides the game overall, it is sad to say goodbye to this part of Destiny's identity. This wasn't the only major paradigm shift for the franchise though, which brings us to the next hot button issue, Sunsetting. On February 26, 2020, Destiny's creative director Luke Smith released a director's cut blog post. In it, he hinted at many of the things that would come to fruition with Beyond Light. Things like back-end technology changes, vaulting content, and the way that Destiny would tackle the issue of aspiration. Luke said he felt like there was something missing within Destiny and that to solve that, they needed to quote, refuel aspiration in Destiny 2, end quote. Luke's thesis was twofold. Firstly, he said that the way Bungie was treating weapons in Destiny didn't fuel the aspiration engine because you could get breakneck and then be done forever. You don't need to chase a different primary because breakneck does the job, so why replace it? Secondly, he argued that this approach created power creep. He likened it to magic cards, where you could keep all of the best, most powerful cards and then use them in any format forever. If breakneck is good and you can constantly infuse it, then the only way to make you chase something else is to make something stronger than breakneck. This will only lead to never-ending and exponential power creep. Both of Luke's points were entirely accurate and reasonable, and I don't think anyone would argue that these issues exist and must be solved for the long-term health of the game. On May 14th, 2020, the This Week at Bungie update spelled out how these changes would manifest. Gear would have a maximum infusible power level based on the season when it dropped. It would have a maximum shelf life of 12 months, and then it would no longer be infusible to the newly raised power cap. In short, Destiny has always been a game where whatever you earn, you can keep it and use it forever. Now Destiny was a game where whatever you earn, it's only good for as little as a day and a max of 12 months. This applies to all legendary weapons and armor, but not to exotics. This whole approach is what's now referred to by the community as sunsetting. Now I'm going to earn myself some downvotes here and say that conceptually, I really like this idea and I think that when we're through the teething phase, we're going to arrive at a better Destiny. We're going to be at a place where Bungie feel more confident to make crazy cool shit because they no longer have to fear power creep. They can make us stuff as fun and as powerful as Seraph weapons and Warmind mods, knowing that they don't then need to make something even more powerful after that, with all the balance issues that come with it. It's also just cool to know that I won't be using Seraph Warmind forever. I like it right now, it's definitely fun, but I look forward to a new PvE meta so that I won't have to spend the next three years of my life shooting basketballs. Having said all of that, there's many problems with the way Bungie have implemented this change. Firstly, it's really dumb that I can earn items that aren't at the current power level. If I go to the moon or the dreaming city, which the game does ask me to do by the way, it sucks that some of the items I get are below power. Like, Destiny is a game that only has seven destinations to visit, but only one of those destinations offers me items at my own power level at this point. If I spend time on the Tangled Shore with the intention of collecting forsaken weapons and armor from Spider, I can get them. They're just useless is all. The game has so few places to visit now. Each of those places should be inviting you there with the promise of unique and interesting things to collect. Instead, the door is slammed shut. Outside the specific activities in other locations that award powerful weekly rewards, there is never ever a reason to spend time anywhere other than Europa because all of the loot that you could chase has been sunset. Secondly, it's really dumb that Bungie has sunset items from previous seasons only to reintroduce the same item this season. So you might have a long shadow sniper rifle from like the launch of Destiny and it might have perfect rolls on it and you love it. Bad luck, it's useless now because your version has been sunsetted, but Long Shadow still exists in the current loot pool as something that can be infused to max power. What Bungie is essentially saying here is, we want you to earn the exact same item again because that fuels the aspiration engine. Now personally for me, that definitely fuels an engine, but it isn't the aspiration engine. I can tell you that right now. Finally, and this is the most important one, if you're gonna sunset items, you gotta give us new shit to chase. This expansion has added a criminally low number of weapons, armor pieces, and mods. 
The meta right now is chasing stuff from last year, the Seraph weapons, the Warmind mods, and the Charge with Light mods. I'm sure Destiny experts will tell you that there are important weapons added to the loot pool this time around, and they're right, but even Bungie themselves have admitted that they dropped the ball here, and they've committed to expanding their weapons team to provide more stuff in future. This is ultimately what I meant when I said that Beyond Light felt more like demolition than creation. Not only were huge sections of the game removed, Bungie also removed reasons to want to visit the spaces that remain, and on top of that, very little was added to the new parts of the game to make them truly enticing. It's a feedback loop that combines to make Destiny 2 feel smaller and less inviting than it's been since its disappointing launch state. And this is where we come back to that question of trust. Do you trust Bungie to cycle content in and out of the vault without the game feeling too small or too reliant on recycled content? Do you trust Bungie to develop new and interesting weapons and mods each season that are just as fun or more fun than those being sunset? What Bungie have done here is by themselves a lot of agility, making it easier for them to focus on new content and for that content to stand on its own feet, unburdened by the power debt that comes from years and years of accrued weapon perks. These are good foundations for the future, but they're just that, foundations. Right now, there's less game here to play and less stuff to collect, so it's a good thing that Destiny's endgame is in a pretty good spot at the moment. While the Beyond Light campaign offers little to new or lapsed players, rusted on veteran players will find that the current Destiny 2 endgame is in one of the best spots it's ever been. Previously, Destiny has always felt like a real crapshoot when it comes to acquiring specific items or specific roles on those items. You just played and prayed that the thing you wanted to drop, dropped, and that its roles weren't terrible. More recently, Bungie have given us a lot more agency when it comes to farming for legendaries, god roles, and exotics. The Master Lost Sectors are a good example. These are activities designed with solo players in mind, where you complete a Lost Sector and it's really hard, but you get to farm for specific exotic slots. So if you really need an exotic arm piece to drop, you've got a specific activity that lets you chase that. The Empire Hunt missions are just the missions that we did during the campaign, but farming these allows you to obtain the Cloud Strike Sniper Rifle, which is a very on-meta weapon that feels like it's worth grinding for. The Wrathborn Hunts from Aldrin Sov, the Crow, they're pretty phoned in events, but the lure allows you to target specific weapons or armor, and then include or exclude specific perks, allowing you to chase items with at least a little more confidence that they won't be complete garbage when they drop. The Nightfall offers a variety of difficulties, some of which can be matchmade, giving players a way into the Nightfall that has been long, long requested. Last week, Grandmaster Nightfalls arrived, and while this season they don't really provide much of a reward, next season they'll offer unique adept weapons and mods. This mirrors what we see in Trials of Osiris, which is back, and for the sweats that are interested in it, it's pretty good. The weapons that drop are cool and the way they masterwork is interesting and the adept mods you can slot into them provide meaningful improvements without looking like they'll break the game. The competitive side of Destiny is never going to please everyone, but Trials is one thing that feels like it has a lot of the right ingredients. Teamwork, social interaction, high skill ceiling, build diversity, tense clutches, compelling rewards. Luke Smith actually called out Trials as part of his Director's Cut blog, saying that it felt like a really key part of Destiny, and when it was missing, Destiny felt incomplete. I agree with that, and I don't even really like Trials. Trials is by no means perfect, but it feels like one of the few components of Destiny where the future is about tending the garden rather than wholesale excavation. Gambit. Now sadly, Gambit is not great, which is a shame because I feel like Gambit is a far more interesting competitive activity in Destiny than straight PvP, but I know that's a minority opinion. The recent streamlining of Gambit into what exists today really relegates it to a kind of tier 2 offering. It feels like it's just being put out to stud while Bungie focuses on other aspects of the game. That's fine, I get it, you gotta focus on what players want and they don't want Gambit. Though I'll always feel like Gambit never got its day in the sun because of how much heavy ammo completely boned that game mode, even during Season of the Drifter. The raid is a tricky conversation. First of all, it's a pretty good raid, I think. Nowhere near as grand or overawing as The Last Wish or King's Fall, 
but you get to kill a lot of stuff, and I like that, since many Destiny raid encounters have felt like finicky Rubik's Cubes more than they felt like actual combat encounters. There's been a lot of discussion about how easy this raid is. Some content creators in the community have received some backlash for suggesting that the raid is too easy. Having now experienced this raid for myself, I cannot believe that anyone disagrees with the idea that this raid is easy. Yes, I ran with an experienced team of people who knew what to do, and I had a really good Sherpa, shout out to my man Carlo, but for real, this raid is like a joke, it, it is, I'm sorry. Nothing can kill you, you're basically invincible. There's heaps of trash enemies to kill, but none of them pose any challenge whatsoever. The 1220 nightfalls I do, I just get match made into, they're more of a challenge than this raid. Lost sectors are harder than this raid. The only way to die in this raid is if you mess up the mechanics. It shouldn't be that way. It should be about the mechanics as well as the general strain and pressure applied by actual combat. Never have I experienced a Destiny raid where that balance was so lacking. Back in the day, we used to have hard mode raids. That was good. I don't know why they removed that. Now they have contest mode, which just lowers your item level. Having enemies with more health and more damage output is a good start, but I'd be more interested in Bungie designing actual hard mode encounters that feel more epic, more edge of your seat, and reward adept level gear and mods. As trials is the preeminent PvP activity, raiding is the preeminent PvE activity, and right now this raid feels like half a step up from a strike playlist. Some serious work needs to go into revitalizing this aspect of the game. The last thing I've really appreciated about Destiny's Endgame as I've returned to it is how carefully Bungie have protected the quality of their product. I know that sounds weird, but this genre fucking sucks when it comes to reliability and quality. Broken items, broken quests, broken servers, broken economies. Destiny's not immune to any of that, but the effects are felt far less keenly here. When I log into Destiny, I know that I can set my own speed, my own difficulty, my own goals, and I know that 99.99% of the time, it's going to work as I expected it to. Bungie doesn't get enough credit for so consistently maintaining such a high quality bar, especially in a genre where that bar is often so low. I mean, the decision to invest in an endgame is about saying, this game is worth my time. Part of that equation is knowing that the game will always be there for you whenever you want it to be. And Destiny is almost always there. For our alone time, for our time with our buddies, for the sweaty competitive showdowns, for the day one raid runs, Destiny is there. And when we log into it, we don't hope that it works. We expect excellence and Destiny rarely falters. I think that deserves a lot more recognition than it currently gets. So this section isn't really about Beyond Light, it's really just things I think about Destiny now that I'm back, so, you know, we're, we're just jamming here. What I find fascinating about Destiny is the way that it exists at the tension point between so many irreconcilable differences. So what do I mean by that? If you ask your average WoW player why they play, they're probably going to say raiding, and within that everyone has similar goals, which is to beat all the bosses and get the best gear that they can. WoW players know they will never get fully maxed out gear unless they do progression mythic raiding with a hardcore guild, and they're okay with that. There's not a lot of tension in World of Warcraft's core design or the way the community reacts to that design. Same goes for like Fortnite or any battle royale. Everyone's there for the same reason, to get a victory royale. Sure, some players want more ways to earn in-game currencies and some people want the rocket launcher or the jetpack or whatever. but broadly speaking everyone's on the same page even games that are better known for their community tensions the problems that they're contending with are pretty singular should time to kill in call of duty be slower or faster should it be boots on the ground or advanced movement should the sniper rifle one shot on body shots should skill-based matchmaking be enabled and under what conditions etc they're all pretty singular challenges, largely disconnected from one another, and they can be solved or addressed in ways that don't challenge the fundamental aspects of Call of Duty's identity. Unlike most games, Destiny is essentially the unsolvable equation. Half of its players say the game is boring and grindy because there's nothing to do, while the other half say the game is boring and grindy because there's too much to do. Half of its players love PvP, the other half hate it. 
Some argue that the PvP sandbox is too ability dependent, while others argue that the abilities are what make it destiny in the first place. Some argue we need Breakneck and Recluse and Mountaintop to motivate players and reward achievement, while others argue that weapons this powerful completely destroy the competitive experience. Some say the raid is too easy, while others say any effort to welcome more people into the raiding community is a good thing. Some want raid matchmaking, others will fight to the death to oppose that. For some, Destiny is a thing you do every few months when something new comes out. For others, Destiny is a hobby. For others, Destiny is an all-consuming void into which every spare second is poured and it still feels like the game demands more. It's possible for a game to collapse under the weight of all this tension, but Destiny has endured because the core of it, the gunplay, the art design, the characters, the lore, the weapon variety, the encounter design, they're all top-notch. But at the same time, Bungie has managed to keep their game at the midpoint between these competing aspirations and motivations. The raids will never be achievements on the same level as a World of Warcraft world first, but nor will Bungie adopt the raid finder matchmaking tool that sustains WoW's casual raiding community. Crucible and Trials will never be an eSport, but nor will it be decoupled from the game as Final Fantasy XIV or Warframe have done. Destiny has always served up a story, but it will never do so in a way that doesn't also ask you to dig deep to find its most compelling aspects. Destiny exists as a compromise between competing motivations, and the only way to truly appreciate Destiny is to first accept it as deeply compromised by intention, not by some sort of laziness or ineptitude, and accept that this compromised state gives it the resilience it needs to appeal to and appease as many people as possible. Having said all of that, it's still important for us to talk about the things we like and don't like about it. That's how Bungie calibrates their game. Sometimes they'll agree with us, sometimes they won't, but they'll always be listening. And in that spirit, I wanna say that as much as I think Destiny is going in the right direction in a lot of ways, it really feels like it's going in the wrong direction when it comes to grinding. And I think the grind currently holds back players from enjoying the best that Destiny has to offer. When I started making my way through Beyond Light's Endgame, I got the distinct feeling that it was just so hard to know what I should be doing or chasing. Since I'd left the game, I'd lost my understanding of what the meta was, the best weapons for each activity, the best god roles to chase. The mod system was entirely new and it didn't make any sense to me and I had no idea which mods were good. There were no longer any pinnacle weapons to motivate me to spend time in the playlists. There was no reason to visit anywhere but Europa unless I was chasing a specific powerful reward. I just felt really lost and really disengaged. The only guiding star I had at this point was the power grind, which is, in my view, the worst, dumbest, most repetitive part of the Destiny experience. The power grind in Destiny is bad because it conditions the player to switch off their brain and do anything in the name of chasing this arbitrary number delaying for weeks the player's engagement in more meaningful, more interesting systems. Players have limited time, especially as they get older, and instead of getting players to think about building a unique and interesting build, or deepening their mastery with sniper rifles in PvP, or specializing in competitive gambit, or maximizing strike scores, or chasing a specific pinnacle reward or whatever, the game just says, don't worry about any of that for now, just chase this stupid number for the next three or four weeks and you can worry about all of the good stuff later. Now we have to recognize that for some, the power grind is a legitimate incentive. I put this out on Twitter and many people were like, no, we like the power grind. It gives me an incentive to play. Fair enough, I get that. Progression, however illusory, is a legitimate thing that people crave and the power system definitely ticks that box. The number goes up. But I really feel like at this point, the power grind serves as far more of a roadblock than an incentive. The grind just makes Destiny look really dumb and unsophisticated. So many people say to me, Destiny is just boring, repetitive garbage, where every season or whatever, you go back and you just do the same shit over and over again, and that's it. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, but also, no, it's really not just that. There's a lot more to it. But I can understand why people think that, because when people come to it, or they return to it, the first thing they experience is the same shit they've always experienced. It's killing the same enemies in the same playlists because of the same old power grind. Destiny's power grind made a lot of sense back in 2015 because it was new and we hadn't experienced anything like that before, and because it solved the Forever 29 problem. 
Now we have pinnacle gear drops and seasonal artifacts, and we have armor 2.0, and we have seasonal events that let us chase specific weapons and armor. We have competitive PvP ranks and trials cards. We have strike scoring and triumphs and iron banner and holiday events and raid challenges. And straddling all of this, we have the endless chase for god roll weapons and armor. There are so many progression pathways for us when we play Destiny, and all of them are more interesting than the power grind we have to do every few months for no other reason than it's just a thing we do. I think this part of the game needs reform so that the player base can be more quickly connected to more interesting goals. The other aspect of the grind that really bums me out is the materials grind. In Beyond Light, you now require a mix of Glimmer, Legendary Shards, Enhancement Cores, Enhancement Prisms, and Ascendant Shards to fully upgrade your gear. Most of these materials are really easy to come by. Enhancement Prisms and Ascendant Shards are not. They can only be purchased for a very, very high price from the Gunsmith vendor or from Spider, or they can be grinded by doing the Nightfall. The Nightfall isn't a playlist, by the way. It's a single strike that rotates once a week, so if you need these materials, the game is asking you to play the same strike over and over and over again to acquire them. I've spent more than 60 hours over the past three weeks playing Destiny. I have 12 enhancement prisms and like three ascendant shards. At this point, I can't upgrade a single set of armor and weapons if I wanted to after 60 hours of play. Now I can get my builds to about 70% complete without these materials, but 70% doesn't feel good. I look at the missing energy on my armor and the mods I could slot into those and I think, man, wouldn't that be nice? I don't spend my enhancement prisms because they're so rare and inaccessible to me that I feel this anxiety like, oh, what if the next item that drops is a god roll, 70 base stat chess piece, and I have no prisms to masterwork it. So I just walk around all the time with this gimped ass gear, pissed off that I'm too poor to fully upgrade it. This progression economy would make a lot of sense in a game like World of Warcraft, where you're really only intending to get one set of gear with static rolls once every few months. This would provide a logical long tail upgrade path for that gear since you're not looking to collect any more gear. Destiny isn't like that. It's not about collecting one set of shoulder pads, it's about collecting all the shoulder pads. It's not about one playstyle, it's about the possibility of dozens of potential playstyles depending on your class or subclass or weapons or mods or whatever. Destiny is in one moment trying to promote all of this unique build diversity, while at the same time essentially making it impossible to upgrade a set of gear unless you are the most hardcore of hardcore players. I would love to make six or seven totally different gear sets based on unique exotics or designed to maximize my performance in the Crucible or that make completing Nightfall high scores easier. That sort of goal of creating unique gear sets is so far beyond my reach, so impossible, that I have completely removed any hope of that from my mind. Destiny is a game with so many build options, so why is it actively discouraging you from creating unique builds? All of these problems become further compounded when it comes to sunsetting, where before the gear that you upgraded and masterworked would last forever, now it lasts for like a season, two seasons, three seasons, four seasons max, and then you're out. Your gear has a shelf life now, but the material economy required to fully upgrade that gear has remained unchanged. This is probably a real hot take, but if you just deleted enhancement prisms and ascendant shards from the game right now, Destiny just becomes less grindy and way more engaging because I can start thinking about the builds I'd like to create and way more fun because I get to actually play with those builds. Right now, this power level and this materials grind make Destiny feel like it's a game only speaking to the most hardcore, dedicated players. As I said in the intro, coming back to Destiny, I didn't get the feeling that the game was trying to earn my business. It didn't reach out to me and try to show me something really interesting or really engaging. There's an implication in Beyond Light that you already know what Destiny is and you already want to play it. Destiny is like the hot girl at the party that makes no effort to talk to anyone else because she expects everyone to want to talk to her. And when you do talk to her, she's like, ugh, you're boring. Go find me some strikes. This all changes as you get to the end game where you can quickly see a game that's worth investing in. It's just that most people will never get there. And when they do get there, the grind to experience the best the game has to offer is just too much. I think Bungie should turn their attention to pruning a lot of this back so that the game and the players can breathe.
This has been a fairly critical review in many aspects, so I want to finish by discussing the context in which Beyond Light was developed. This year, Bungie completed work on a back-end technical overhaul. This has some effect on player experiences like more seamless matchmaking or a better lighting engine, but more importantly, it gives Bungie the power to make or fix content faster. That's a good thing because Destiny's development tools were famous for being awful. Hopefully, players will feel the benefits of these new tools soon. Secondly, Destiny went free to play in 2019. Anyone can log in and play some Destiny for free now. Not a lot, since most of the free stuff got deleted with the Destiny Content Vault, but enough that if you wanted to try Destiny and really get a sense for what it was like, you could do that. With that change comes a massive influx of new players, as well as a realignment of Bungie's core business model. And can I say it's pretty cool that Bungie made this move without loading up the Eververse store with heaps of gameplay ruining bullshit and boosters, which they certainly could have done and justified with the whole free to play thing, so hats off for that. The game also came to Xbox Xbox Game Pass. Not PC just yet, that'll be next year, but if you're on Xbox and you have a Game Pass subscription, you can play the entire Destiny 2 experience at the base game, Forsaken, Shadowkeep, and Beyond Light for the $10 monthly cost. That doesn't include seasonal content though, but still, that's pretty great. Speaking of Xbox and PlayStation, Destiny made the jump to next gen with Beyond Light. On the 10th of December, a free update was pushed out that was just incredible basically since destiny launched on pc i have always played there because 30 fps destiny on a console isn't great and the load times are slow and the menus are slow and there's no adjustable field of view slider etc pc was just better not anymore now destiny is on ps5 and xbox series x and it's a rock solid 60 fps and it's up to 120 fps in the crucible if your tv can handle that and there's an adjustable fov slider i play more destiny on my ps5 and my xbox now than i do on my pc because i prefer destiny on my couch i just do it's so good to be playing destiny on a big ass tv sitting on the couch that's where i've had my best times with destiny and it feels good to be back where it all began, the couch. You might have noticed that I mentioned PS5 and Xbox there, and there's a reason for that. Cross save now exists. I can play Destiny on any platform I choose, and my progress is saved centrally so that when I switch over to a different platform, I can pick up where I left off. Many people won't use this feature. I use it a lot, and I never cease to be thankful for it. You know what else was big this year for Bungie? They broke up with Activision in 2019, and 2020 was the first full year that Bungie went it alone. No help from the Activision studios High Noon or Vicarious Visions. This was the first time Bungie had been an independent studio since Microsoft acquired them in 2000. After relying for so long on the financial security and resources of a large publisher, it would have been incredibly difficult to successfully manage the transition to an independent studio, but Bungie pulled it off. Finally, there was one other curveball that 2020 had in store for Bungie, and for everyone really, Corona. Bungie staff have been working from home most of the year. They did everything I've just described and delivered a new expansion while working from home. That's insane. I can't organize a one-on-one -on -one doctor's consultation over Zoom without screwing it up. These guys found a way to get 800 people on the same page and build a fucking video game expansion to one of the largest video games in the world. I think it's pretty clear from my commentary here that I don't think Beyond Light was Destiny's best expansion ever. And right now, Destiny is not a game that I would recommend to anyone who is not already a Destiny addict. The game has been better in the past and you get the distinct feeling that it will likely be better in the future. Having said that, I am in awe that Bungie were able to deliver this expansion and everything that came with it under the circumstances that Bungie faced. What a Herculean effort to push through so much and still rebuild their technology and still roll out onto next-gen hardware and still go free to play and still deliver an expansion that isn't the Taken King or Forsaken, but nor is it an unmitigated disaster that's getting pulled from shelves. It's a perfectly functional continuation of the Destiny experience that takes some bold steps to position the franchise for the future. While I don't think that Beyond Light will be remembered for its greatness, I think it will likely be remembered as an inflection point for the franchise. Equal in import to the Taken King or the release of Destiny 2 or Forsaken, Destiny has changed significantly here, and it remains to be seen what the full impact of those changes will be. Regardless, 
If this is what Bungie can do with one hand tied behind their back, imagine what they could do next year. I'd log in for that. Twenty twenty, boy, that was fun, wasn't it? Well, on the plus side, at least 2020 gave us the chance to watch more TV or play more games or read more books, or in my case, listen to more books. Yes, Audible, that's right, you've heard of it, the world's largest selection of audiobooks and audio entertainment. As I've said to you many times before, Audible is one of the few things I couldn't live without as I spend, I don't know, somewhere from 5 to 20 hours a week plugged into this service on average, listening to audiobooks or different Audible originals. Which audiobooks do I listen to, you might ask? Well, you know that Netflix show with that PC gamer guy? A lot of people think that was based on a game. Turns out it was based on a book. Can you believe it? What about that Queen's Gambit show starring the kid from Love Actually who's grown up into a creepy looking cowboy? Turns out that show was also based on a book. I've also heard, and this is unconfirmed, but I've heard that The Lord of the Rings was based on a book as well. And I know that's crazy, I can't believe it. I always thought the book was based on the movie, but the staff at Audible, they assure me that isn't the case. So I don't know, we'll, we'll just have to trust them on that one. Audible is a big part of my daily life, as it means I can listen to audiobooks when I'm driving, when I'm out for a run, or when I'm grinding power levels in Destiny, for example. I can grind levels in Destiny while listening to books. That's a pretty good deal. Start listening with a 30-day audio free trial, choose one audiobook and gain full access to their plus catalogue absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash skillup or text skillup to 500 500. Thanks Audible for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.